Get up! Get up! In the name of our loving and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Get up! Get up! These are the words a loving spouse is humming and singing on a Sunday morning, bringing coffee to the bedroom for their other spouse. As they hear no movement from said spouse, they knock on the door. Jamie, he says, wake up. Jamie answers, I don't want to get up. And then the spouse shouts back, get up, you have to go to church. And Jamie says, I don't want to go to church. Why not? Asks the spouse. Three reasons, says Jamie. First, because it's so dull. Second, the parishioners ask weird questions. And third, parishioners get on my nerves sometimes. And the loving, frustrated spouse says, well, I'm going to give you three reasons why you must go to the church house. First, because it's your duty. Second, because you're 35 years old. And third, because you're the priest in charge. <laughs> Father Anthony DeMello, a Jesuit priest, tells a similar story at the beginning of his book, Awareness. He uses it to send home his message that in order to lead a spiritual life, one has to first get up. The scriptures for today, they call us to pay attention to what's going on in the world around us and to develop a perspective that will help us distinguish between false messiahs and the message of Jesus. Each of us is invited to inwardly digest this biblical story and to familiarize ourselves with the situations or stories in our own lives. And the good news is that this is an old story, uh, but it's a necessary story and it's part of the story of our salvation. The gospel passage today is also a wake up call. It comes from the chapter of Mark that has been come to known as the little apocalypse. Apocalyptic is the loud knock, the harsh voice, and the cold floor meeting your bare feet when you would rather stay safe and warm in your comfortable bed. Apocalyptic is always a call to wake up to a spiritual reality. Jesus is always saying things to startle his, fellow, his followers into wakefulness. At the beginning of this chapter in Mark, Jesus comes out of the temple with four of his disciples. And one of them commented, look, teacher, what huge stones, what wonderful buildings. And you can imagine a sunny day, the smiling disciples, and then splash. Jesus throws cold water of apocalyptic messages by telling them there will not be one stone left here on another. Not one that will be thrown down. The disciples' smiles turns to the anxious frowns and they ask, When? When will this happen? How will we know what is about to happen? And Jesus, being the enigma at times he was, does not answer their questions directly. First, he warns them of the sufferings and the persecutions they will suffer and exhorts them to endure. And finally, he tells them more specifically about the destruction of the temple. He says the sign of the moment has arrived and will be the appearance of the desolate sacrilege. This phrase comes also from the book of Daniel, where it refers to the altar to Zeus set up on the altar of burnt offerings by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC. This act of idolatry was desolating because it puts an end to temple worship at that time. Now, Jesus is using this historical phrase to predict a future and similar event. There will be some future desecration that will lead to the end of the temple. And although we're not sure what that desecration was, we do know that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. But in this passage, it's enough of the history lesson. But in this passage particularly, there are two aspects of an apocalyptic situation, the predictive and the historic, that's very relevant to our lives where we live and are and function today. The passage was predictive when Jesus uttered it, but it was predictive in the historical setting of this time as well. But is that all this passage has to say to us right now at that moment? 
Doesn't this passage render something different in us today? I don't know about you, but growing up in a very evangelical, fundamentalist sense, I heard this passage preached on quite often. I heard it preached on that the end time was near. And if any of you follow the daily office, a lot of our readings from this past couple of weeks has been from the book of Revelation. This end time, this apocalyptic sense, how striking it is for this extraordinary long time of ordinary time that we are in this year, that we're now right before our final Sunday, we're talking about the end of time and to watch out for false prophets. Now, we as Episcopalians often don't talk about things like this. We just kind of brush that off. We don't really deal with the end times. But this story concludes with a warning about false messiahs and prophets. Now, these presumably are people with messages that are meant to divert us from the truth and offering cheap solace in the face of the hardest moments of life. Distinguishing between those who say we want to hear and those who might be speaking an uncomfortable truth requires a spiritual maturity. It requires us getting up. It requires us embracing this hard topic. The easy answers, the comfortable answers to the dilemmas of life, they do not offer the hope of transforming. They do not offer a reforming of our situations. This is what Jesus is saying to us today. By warning of difficult times, Jesus points to the time when all that he has done and taught will need to be utilized. Sound familiar in our world today? What are the ways that we can be tempted away from this gospel? First, I see a lot of vengeance happening in our world. And that's very tempting. And on the other hand, passivity, just being passive. Well, that doesn't really affect me. Why am I going to be concerned with that? Choosing pleasure over responsibility. And never taking a moment to enjoy life. Never taking a Sabbath. That's another temptation. If there's anything I've learned over the past five years of my life, that life cannot and will not be lived by a formula of what you think is going to happen, whatever could happen or what will happen. And in this passage, Jesus is urging his followers to be alert, to be woke, to grow up and be ready to advance the cause of the kingdom when the opportunity is going to present itself. Learning where God is calling us often requires a breathing space. It, calls it, it requires a physical distance. It, call, it calls for a discernment within our hearts. And it's another way of saying we're going to make space for grace to indwell in our hearts. We're going to make space for God to be present within our realities. When we don't do that, we do face very apocalyptic situations in our lives. We do find despair. We do, found, do find distrust. We do find ourselves yearning for the presence of God. Now I ask you, where is this story happening for you in your life right now? Where is your story? Where in your home, your office, your church, your community, do you see all that you hold dear being profaned, being mocked? How do you make space for God in the moment of these crises? How do you make space for God's grace in an apocalyptic situation? Where are the ways you can pull back from impulse and respond and regroup? Who are the false messiahs? Who distract us from the understanding, acceptance, compassion, mercy, truth, and justice? This very week, a very wise and dear friend who also happens to be a priest said this statement to me. 
Do not let your anxiety cloud your understanding. Oftentimes in our lives, we allow anxiety to overshadow the reality of God's grace where it's present at that moment. And when we do that, we are embracing a false prophet. We turn our back on the true Messiah and we're setting ourselves up for an apocalyptic situation. The point of what Jesus says in this passage is not, go sit on your rooftops and wait for me to come again. Neither is it roll over in your bed and go back to sleep. The passage to me paints a picture of terrible disaster and suffering and agony and the human condition at its worst. And it implies that this distress is the great tribulation which precedes the end of the age. The truth is the world has never been without massive suffering, ever. We've never been without wars, famines, refugee migrations, mass murders and holocausts, natural disasters, epidemics. And when they are happening to you and to the people that you love, you indeed are in a great tribulation. It is the end of the world as you know it. But there is one constant that if we cling to, we go to grace. We let grace abide. We let grace inhabit. We indwell in that grace. That's when we get up and we let it happen. And when this great tribulation hits our lives, are you awake or are you asleep? Do you come prepared with a knowledge of God's love and care, which can give you hope and stamina to endure? Or do you come as people who have postponed knowing God? Do you come as casual or nominal people of faith? Or do you come with commitment and trust? Do you hear this wake up call as a call to a greater responsibility for the stewardship of your life and all creation? Or do you hear it as an excuse to abdicate responsibility and to project onto God your own destructiveness because of your own lack to dwell in that grace? I think for this time in our lives, the tribulation is here and the tribulation is going to come and it's going to be present. And those who are awake are called to stay awake, to proclaim the good news of the grace of our Jesus Christ to those who have no reason to hope, who have no reason to keep on keeping on, who have every reason to turn over in that bed again and not go to church on that Sunday morning or not get up and go volunteer or not just pick up the phone to someone that's hurting to have a lack of empathy. Jesus wants us to wake up to the fact that the decisions that we are making today have eternal weight on us. That's something you don't hear an Episcopal priest say very often, is it? I'm going to repeat that statement. Jesus wants us to wake up to the fact that decisions that we are making today have eternal weight. We can decide to roll over and go back to sleep because God's not going to force us to wake up. Or you can get up and discover that you're 35, 51, 79, 12, and you got a job to do. It's time to get up. In God's name, amen.